Hi, good evening. So this virtual classroom session will have a discussion on fundamentals of food preparation, right? Just give me two minutes and just adjust these things and then we'll proceed with discussion. Hi, hi Nidhi, Swapnil, Pritika, Prithvi, Ashina, Megha, Shruti, Ramesh, Priti, hello. Shruti, Sajit, hi. Hi, Vishay. So, hi everyone, a very good evening, right? So, today, uh, in this virtual classroom session, we'll have a discussion on fundamentals of food preparation. So, if you have any questions in between, you can post them there. Okay, if possible, uh, depending upon the context, I will stop if necessary and I will discuss over them also. But mostly, I will try to discuss all your uh, queries at the end of session, right? Yeah, so this is a very elaborate topic, so I will try to uh, condense it as much as possible. At the same time, we will try to provide as much information, as much information with quality, right? So that's the focus of today's virtual classroom session. Yeah, so first of all, Fundamentals of tooth preparation. So, uh, before starting today's session, I would like to start with the definition of operative dentistry. So, what is the objective and what is the aim of treating patients or, or uh, in specific operative dentistry? So, what are we trying to achieve? So, that's given in a beautiful manner, in a precise manner, with a clear description, the definition itself. So. I mean, it's the most common question which is asked during Viva also. But once you understand the definition, the beauty of the definition is you'll get comprehensive understanding of that particular uh, word and also if possible or if appropriate, the entire branch. For example, operative dentistry, it's defined as an art and science of diagnosis, treatment planning and prognosis of defects of tooth which do not require full coverage restorations for correction. Such treatment should result in restoration of proper tooth form, function and aesthetics while maintaining the physiologic integrity of tooth in harmonious relationship with its and hard and soft tissues, all of which should enhance the general health and welfare of the patient. So ultimately it's the general health and welfare of the patient which is, as, as we keep on saying, oral health and overall health they are interrelated. So we are concerned mostly regarding the form, function and aesthetics and we are not including full coverage restorations in operative dentistry. So all restorations except full coverage are included under operative dentistry. For example, amalgam restorations, composite restoration, inlays, onlays, partial onlays, what not, right? So all these except the full coverage restorations come under operative dentistry. So that's the beauty of understanding the definition. If you memorize it or not, that's secondary. But you need to understand the definition to have an overview of the subject, right? So that's operative dentistry for you. And now, tooth preparation. So we have these terms called as cavity preparation and tooth preparation. And remember, in today's ses uh, session, we'll discuss general terms. General terms and also few basics pertaining to fundamentals of tooth preparation. And then we'll proceed with various steps in tooth preparation and few important relevant points pertaining to these steps in PG orientation, right? So previously we used to call or we used to use the term cavity prep rather than tooth preparation. But nowadays we are using the term tooth preparation. So what could be the reason? So there is a subtle difference between cavity prep and tooth preparation. So cavity is nothing but as you know it's a breach in surface integrity. So previously during the times of uh, G.V. Black and uh, history, uh, mostly the operative procedures were performed only when the patient had this caries or cavitation. So cavitation usually was because of caries, mostly. So they used to excavate all the caries, fill up, uh, I mean uh, modify the cavity dimensions if necessary, for example like amalgam and then fill up the tooth, right? So the preparation which is done in order to 
make sure that the cavity is modified and restored with an appropriate material. So that was called as cavity preparation. But now we are modifying tooth not only for excavation of caries but also uh, for example uh, in case of FPDs we modify or we reduce the tooth structure right. Uh, in case of fractures we round off the line angles or we place bevels if necessary and go for composite right. So enameloplasty or coronoplasty. So we are modifying or adjusting tooth structure for various other purposes not only for uh, caries related activity right so that's the reason why we are using the term tooth preparation nowadays and tooth preparation is a wide uh, term which includes all these various treatments which we discussed now so the most appropriate term to be used now is tooth preparation rather than using cavity prep in fact tooth preparation also includes cavity preparation right so these are all the basics which we need to be familiar with now cavity preparation and tooth preparation we discussed it right so we have previously again this concept of at the same at the time of uh, gv black green or even black who is considered as a father of operative dentistry so uh, the concept was like extension for prevention but now it's like prevention of extension with the advent of newer materials and newer techniques right and also i just wanted to discuss with you the fundamental concepts of tooth preparation and overview so what are we trying to achieve by implying fundamentals of a tooth preparation. Remember, fundamentals of tooth preparation includes, the fundamental concepts include, removal of all unsupported enamel. I mean, if you had observed one of the videos on noise principles, I posted one video on noise principles previously. You can just check that video. We discussed in detail the orientation of enamel rods and what is the significance of cavo surface margin and how should be the orientation of enamel uh, while going for different kinds of restorative materials. Right? So noise principles are very important. And the fundamental concepts of tooth preparation include to remove all unsupported enamel, to remove faults or defects or caries, and remaining tooth structure should be left as strong as possible and obviously protection of pulp and finally restorative material is left or retained strong, aesthetic and functional. If you remember, all these fundamental concepts are addressed in the definition itself, right? So these are some of the fundamental concepts which I wanted to proceed and after going through these fundamental concepts, let's look at the objectives of this tooth preparation. So objectives of tooth preparation again the same it will be like preserving uh, the remaining tooth structure trying to remove all the carious part or infected part and trying to restore not only the restorative part but also the aesthetic part and the functional aspects need to be restored while we are going for restoration so objectives and all these are all general topics but now let's focus on the differences in tooth preparation between Amalgam and composite. If you remember, in one of the live sessions, we covered the differences in tooth preparation between or cavity preparation between an amalgam restoration, amalgam cavity, and inlay. So, this virtual classroom session will first focus on the differences in tooth preparation between amalgam versus composite, and then we'll proceed with few terms like enameloplasty, prophylactic odontotomy, and a few important terminologies, cavo surface angle in brief. And then we'll proceed with various steps in cavity preparation, right? That's how I'm planning today's live session. So I'll just name the category and then we'll have a discussion briefly for amalgam and composite with explanation if necessary. So if you observe, I mean, I, I, I hope you have a textbook or hard copy, right? So fundamentals of tooth preparation. Coming to the differences in outline form. So outline form, it's like extension for prevention in case of amalgam. Usually we need to extend the cavity, keeping in mind the properties of amalgam, right? Because amalgam stays only when it has an adequate thickness of 1.5 mm. In thin sections, it is weak because of its weak head strength or low head strength. So we have some inherent uh, drawbacks associated with the amalgam. So keeping those in mind, we need to extend our outline accordingly, right? And during outline form extension, we also should keep in mind the cusp capping also. So we'll discuss that in detail later during uh, the discussion of various steps of cavity prep. So outline form for amalgam should include de uh, defect, may extend to break the proximal contact if it's a class 2 and includes adjacent suspicious area, right? Whereas composite, 
it will be like as conservatively as conservative as possible we'll try to uh, remove only the defective part but not the suspicious part right so that's the difference in terms of the outline form and coming to pulpal depth usually we need to have a uniform depth so a depth of cavity 1.5 to 2 mm it has to be uniform flat pulpal floor in case of amalgam so it's approximately 1.5 mm whereas uh, in case of composite we need not need to have uniform depth because we have this micro mechanical retention so composite can have varying depths in cavity but the objective there is to remove all the infected dentin or that friable part of dentin and then go for restoration and then axial depth so axial depth again see pulpal depth axial depth everything they have to be uniform in case of amalgam cavities and they need not be uniform in case of composites right and axial depth remember we all we always have this kind of confusion right so axial depth for example let's take this diagram or image so this is the axial depth right so we have an axial wall here or if you see this is the axial wall so this is the axial depth so the axial depth has to be as you can see here 0.5 mm into dentin so that's very important it should be 0.5 mm into dentin the reason why we're trying to push or place your cavity outline or cavity margins in the dentin is dentin has this property of resiliency right shock absorption so similar to shock absorption of your bike or vehicle so that's the reason why we're trying to place the cavity walls internal walls into the dentin right so that's very important so axial depth again it has to be uniform in case of amalgam need not be uniform in case of composite and now most important the cavo surface margin so this is the cavo surface margin or cavo surface angle by the way cavo surface margin is nothing but the junction between the cavity wall and external tooth surface right so this is the cavity wall this is the external tooth surface so how do you measure cavo surface angle take two periodontal probes right place one periodontal probe along the internal wall and one along the external wall and based on that you can calculate the cavo surface angle and by the way in this context this forms the cavo surface angle right so let me just draw here itself so this part gives the cavo surface angle right so if we can measure this angle the outer angle we have something called as corresponding angles if you remember in mathematics right so you can't measure the inner angle right so if you can measure the outer angle then obviously the inner angle can be measured because corresponding angles they are same in value okay so cavo surface margin so as i said in case of amalgam we should have a strong enamel margin refer noise principles you will have much more clear information there so 90 degrees cavo surface or 90 or more than 90 in case of amalgam 90 is preferable it's called as butt joint whereas in case of composite so we we go for placement of bevels if it's a large restoration or for aesthetic considerations we'll discuss that later so cavo surface angle will be much more greater right and bevels in case of amalgam as you know we don't go for bevel placement except at the gingival margin where we go for placement of 15 to 20 degree bevel right we'll discuss that later in detail and composite as i said obviously we go for bevel placement provided if it's a large restoration so large preparation aesthetics and for enhanced seal we go for bevel placement and texture of prepared walls the prepared walls texture have to be smooth comparatively for amalgam uh, it can be rougher it has to be rougher in fact for composite so that it adds up to the retention because the main mode of retention for composite is micro mechanical retention and then cutting instruments we use burrs for amalgam cavity prep or burrs or diamonds for composite diamonds because uh, they have these abrasive particles which create more surface roughness and primary retention so primary retention in case of amalgam is occlusal convergence as you can see right there is primary retention in case of composite it's none so usually we use this bonding concept right so that's appropriate for composite and secondary retention we have grooves slots and pins which we'll discuss in secondary retentive features for amalgam and it's the same for large preparation okay then resistance form so obviously you know resistance form you need to have flat pulpal floor rounding of axle uh, i mean line angles and point angles right and also you should have smooth walls comparatively and most importantly box shaped cavity design in order to resist the forces which act primary primarily along the long axis of the tooth right so that's very important so resistance form in case of composite same for large preparations so similar to that of amalgam and base indications 
we go for so a refer remind dentin thickness video i have posted that previous on youtube you can find more information pertaining to bases liners and varnish and also refer pulp protecting agent so we have two videos pertaining to that in our youtube channel and liner indications the same you can just refer uh, the same video you get more information so by the way base and liner are not indicated for composite however we go for liner placement in composite if it is deep to pulp so we have this a category uh, like a criteria like less than 2 mm ideally we should have a remaining dentin thickness of 2 mm if it is 1.5 to 2 mm we go for base placement if it is less than uh, 1.5 mm or 1 to 1.5 mm we have another criteria and 0.5 to 1.5 mm we have one more criteria and less than 0.5 mm or very close to pulp we have another criteria so all the criteria are discussed in detail in remaining dentin thickness video right and then we have something called as desensitizer Usually we we are not familiar with that in clinical perspective, but uh, desensitizer is nothing but something which is added to the surface of the cavity after completion of cavity prep in order to decrease the sensitivity. Right? There can be exposure of dentinal tubules, there can be fluid movement, and there can be sensitivity, post-op sensitivity. Right? So desensitizer we use dentin desensitizer for amalgam cavity preparations, which includes five percent glutaraldehyde and thirty-five percent hema hydroxyethyl methacrylate. right when you are when you are going for non bonded amalgam but in case of composites we since we go for bonded amalgam i mean we go for bonding agent so no need of separate desensitizer because bonding agent itself helps in micro mechanical retention as well as sealing of the tubules right so these are some of the differences between amalgam and composite and remember we have some criteria while going for i mean while i've discussed about liners in one of the previous videos i haven't mentioned about resin modified glass enamel cement in fact resin modified glass enamel cements are also very well indicated as liners the reason is by the way the thickness of this uh, resin modified glass enamel would be 0.5 to 0.75 mm and the reason why we are preferring resin modified glass enamel as a liner is because it insulates the pulp from thermal changes and mostly it contains resin right so resin it can resist to masticative forces and it also bonds to dentin because it contains resin micro mechanical retention releases fluoride since it's a modification of glass enamel cement and as i said since it is having this micro mechanical retention it decreases the incidence of micro leakage which is very important so these are the reasons or advantages of using resin modified glass enamels in case of uh, i mean in a context where we need a liner right so these are some of the differences between amalgam and composite and then we'll proceed with few terminologies and uh, see accordingly right i hope uh, i hope you guys are following me right so so far since we are having some text i had to use uh, this text in order to explain you but from now we'll uh, try to make use of these illustrations and i'll try to simplify that as much as possible right so uh, do you think i'm going at a faster pace or do you want me to continue at the same pace Yeah, yeah. It's not point five mm axial depth. It has to be point five mm into dentin. So, which translates to, for example, if I am at the level of CEJ, so we'll have an enamel thickness of point two to point three mm there at this level, and so point three or point of enamel plus point five of dentin. So the axial depth there would be point eight mm. If it is almost in the middle third, then it will include this thickness of enamel, which is, for example, one mm. And also point five of tendon. So depending upon the level of your gingival seat, the axial depth varies. So usually we place gingival seat apical to the contact, right, or gingival to the contact. So usually it is point eight mm, or uh, to standardize the depth, we say point five mm into tendon, right. And how do you know whether you are in tendon or not? Because when you prepare a gingival seat, DEJ is clearly visible. You have an amine. dentin enamel junction which is clinically visible so based on that you can uh, say that you are in dentin tunnel preparation in detail is not necessary for you even uh, sturdwens uh, textbook doesn't justify this tunnel preparation anyways we're going to discuss about tunnel preparation also in brief at the end of this session right 
Uh, Sadhana, you say I'm going a bit fast. Okay, the reason why I'm going, I, I, I know, I, I think I, may, I have increased the pace, but uh, since we have a very extensive topic today, so I'm trying to uh, just speed up so that we can comprehensively uh, cover and discuss all the topics. Right, then in that case, I will uh, slow down the pace. You mean to say purple depth and axial depth. So purple depth it has to be 0.2 to 0.5 mm into dentin from the EJ occlusal if you observe, right? So for example, you just consider this as DEJ. So the axial I mean the depth of the cavity has to be 0.2 to 0.5 mm into dentin from DEJ occlusally. But axial depth it has to be 0.5 mm into dentin, right? It is streaming, right? Okay, fine. But uh, in between, you can have some kind of interruptions because it's common, right? In life, yeah. We'll discuss all that current. We'll discuss all that. The basic principles remain the same. The basic principles remain the same. Yeah, we'll discuss. We'll discuss. Uh, reverses and all again, we'll have to go in specific into class training, which we'll discuss at the end of the session, right? Don't worry. Okay, then in that case, I will proceed in the next part. So now, coming to the term enamelloplasty, because I've noticed few questions from these topics, so I've selected a few uh, topics in specific and I'm trying to discuss them. So, as we have discussed about the differences between the amalgam cavity prep and composite cavity prep, which is very important. And now we'll just briefly go through what is enameloplasty and what is prophylactic odontotomy. So as you can see in this image here, I mean, I'm not sure if it is visible. Yeah, it's not really a very, a very uh, finitely visible. So let me just draw that the same diagram here. So assume that you are having this kind of a fissure, a fissure which is shallow, right? So there can be food lodgement over this area. So enamelloplasty is a prophylactic method. So prophylaxis in the sense a preventive kind of a treatment procedure where we will try to perform the tooth preparation using a routine bird and try to round off. So this is called as saucerization. So saucerization is being done in order to convert these shallow or deep fissures into rounded concave surfaces to, so that they can be made self cleansable. So this is the objective of enamelloplasty and we have a very important criteria for enamelloplasty that is if you observe here the depth of the groove should not extend more than one third the thickness of enamel it has to be less than one third the thickness of enamel in order to perform enamelloplasty if there is more than one third then we go for a routine a cavity prep followed by restoration right so that's enamelloplasty for you. And then we have another term called as prophylactic odontotomy. So prophylactic odontotomy is only of historical importance. So it's like, uh, again the same as the name itself indicates, we prepare a cavity, a minimal cavity, uh, covering all the grooves and fissures, and then we go for, we go for placement of amalgam restoration, right? So that's very important. So prophylactic odontotomy is no longer being practiced, and hence it is obsolete, right? So regarding enamelloplasty, I mentioned that point, right? So I'm just checking out, uh, and I'll try to quote the same uh, thing which is given here. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Care is to be taken when choosing the area which will benefit from an amyloplasty. That is, case selection is very important. Usually, a fissure should be removed by normal preparation procedures if it penetrates to more than one third the thickness of enamel. If the depth of the fissure is more than the one third the thickness of enamel. By the way, we can know the thickness of enamel based on radiograph or based on our prior knowledge, right? So while we perform sectioning and all. So we'll have some rough idea, right? So if the depth of the fissure is greater than one third the thickness of enamel, then obviously we have to go for a routine way of a cavity prep followed by restoration. However, if one third or less of enamel depth is involved, so this is very important, right? If one third or less of enamel depth is involved, the fissure may be removed by enameloplasty without preparing or extending the tooth preparation, right? So this is one important criteria or indication for going for enameloplasty. And then we have a few other terms like we often get confused. And by the way, I'm not going to discuss about line angles and point angles. So you know very much about line angles and point angles. So line angle is nothing but a junction between two surfaces and point angle a point where three surfaces meet. So what is an internal line angle and the external line angle? That we often have some confusion. So internal line angle is that line angle whose apex points inwards. And the example for internal line angle is axio gingival line angle. So you have this axial wall, you have this gingival seat, right? So the apex of that line angle is pointing inwards, right? Whereas, assume that this is a facial surface, right? And this is, uh, we have another wall here. So, if you observe, we have a line angle here, right? So, this line angle, or uh, uh, to simplify that, we'll just take out this line angle. So, we have a gingival C and an external surface. So, we have a line angle here which, whose apex is pointing outwards. So, that would be an example for external line angle. Or to further simplify it, axopulpal line angle where the apex, where you have this pulpal floor and axial wall, right? So axial pulpal line angle, the apex is facing outwards. It's an example for external line angle, right? If we often assume that this line angle, uh, since it is present inside the tooth, we often think that it's an internal line angle. So I just wanted to specify that one particular aspect here. So axial gingival line angle would be a best example for an internal line angle whereas axial pulpal line angle is an example for external line angle. So we decide whether it's an internal or external based on the orientation of apex. If the apex is pointing towards or inwards the tooth, it's internal. If it is pointing outwards, then it is external. And then we have already discussed in brief about KO surface margin and KO surface angle. So the junction between a prepared tooth surface and unprepared tooth surface is called as cavo surface margin. And the angle between these two surfaces as I have discussed there like how to measure. So that angle is cavo surface angle. So cavo surface angle for amalgam 90 to 110 degrees. So on 90 degrees we call that as butt joint. And we have for composite we go for bevel placement. For cast restorations we have this cavo surface angle of 30 to 40 degrees and so on right so we have these few important criteria okay so that's pertaining to cavo surface angle now let's proceed into various steps of cavity preparation and before that i'll briefly discuss the classification of the cavities so first of all greeny wadim and black way back in 19th century has given us the classification for presence of cavities or presence of cavity preparations and also based on the treatment so why we have this classification is also important so that's a classification gv black's classification is a classification of tooth preparation according to diseased anatomic areas and also by the associated type of treatment so where do you find diseased anatomic areas as given in text so diseased anatomic areas are nothing but those areas which are prone which are more prone for caries so which areas are more prone for caries those areas where there is food lodgement so where, uh, which areas do you find food lodgement in oral cavity on teeth? So obviously various pits and fissures, interproximal areas, right? So these pits and fissures, they are called as non-self-cleansable areas. Whereas facial surface, lingual surface, 
proximal smooth surface all this come under self cleansable area so based on the self cleansability or based on the property of self cleansability we have these diseased anatomic areas and this classification given by gv black is based on this particular aspect so that's very important so as you all know i need not really go elaborate into this classification but we have certain important points so class 1 to 5 so class 1 it includes occlusal cavities right the cavities present in occlusal aspects of all premolars and molars right so pits and fissures of all posteriorly and also we have facial lingual two thirds of posteriorly like for example buccal extension or palatal extension and we have third category that is palatal surfaces of maxillary incisors so we have three sub classifications in gv black's class 1 right so occlusal surfaces and then occlusal two thirds of uh, facial lingual surfaces of posterior teeth and palatal aspect where you find this palatal pit about about the single in case of maxillary incisors and class 2 so proximal surfaces cavities present on proximal surfaces of posterior teeth class 3 again cavities present on proximal surfaces and anterior teeth without involving incisal angle if incisal edge or incisal angle is involved then it comes in the class 4 and class 5 is as you know cervical areas somewhere here cervical areas of all teeth on facial and lingual aspects right so that is class 5 as you know and class 6 given by simon so cusp tips and incisal edges so cavities present on cusp tips and incisal edges do come under class 6 right so this is in brief the classification part and this classification is based on the diseased anatomic areas and also it's based on the associated type of treatment so here we going for amalgam restoration right so gv black at that time has given classification keeping in mind the amalgam restorations right so that's very important So now let's uh, proceed into the core topic for today's discussion that is steps in cavity preparation very briefly we'll go through all the steps objectives features and few important relevant points pertaining to these steps right so if you have any questions i will just take up your questions now for 2 minutes and then we'll proceed into discussion hi shabita Regina, should we fill it with flow material? What do you mean by flow material? You mean uh, the viscosity? Classroom algorithm sense. What should be the treatment plan for that? Evaluate the cavity clinically. Evaluate the cavity uh, cavity clinically. Uh, even though this amalgam restoration is self cleansable, we can have, or uh, uh, I mean, because of creep and due to many factors, there can be micro leakages. There can be post op sensitivity also. Evaluate the case clinically and radiographically, and then see. If necessary, repeat the, uh, I mean, re-restore the tooth. Check this issue for colon angle, internal angle, mesiofacial. First of all, it's not line angle. You're talking about three surfaces, right? I'm sure mesial, facial, and palpal. I didn't get your question. I'm sure. Restoration with calcium hydroxide base or RCT. Okay, Jeno, you're answering to Shabita. Okay, fine. A sensitivity usually, yeah, we have to evaluate that clinically. If necessary, go for vitality test. Enamelloplasty. See, we we do not restore the tooth. I haven't mentioned that, right? So enamelloplasty, if you remember, is just trying to make the area concave. It will be self-cleansable. That's why I said I use the term self-cleansable. You need not go for any restoration. Prophylactic odontotomy. Uh, they used to play some argument. No longer advocated. Enamelloplasty just sauterize the particular area the shallow or deep fissure right and make it self cleansable so when it is self cleansable during gargling brushing or due to normal physiologic salivary action there won't be any food accumulation over that area so no need of any restoration no need of any uh, placement of any flow materials as you say right pit and fissure sealants are something which are different right so these are not uh, we're not talking about pit and fissure uh, sealants now we're talking about enamelloplast Uh, 
Abhishek, I'm really sorry, but I'm not getting your question. Mesio, facio, pulper. Oh, you're talking about point angle. Okay, fine, fine. Uh, we do not have this classification. See, any classification, I mean any point angle, we don't have this internal or external uh, classification for point angle. So in literature, it's mentioned for line angle, you have internal or external. So you're talking about, okay, let's assume this as mesial, facial, and then pulpal. Medial facial pulpal. Uh, I'm unable to look at your point angle here because pulpal four is somewhere here, right? Or maybe you mean to say gingival rather than pulpal, then this could be the point angle. Yeah, I mean, even uh, this doesn't come under point angle because this is all proximal surface, right? This is all mesial surface. Facial is somewhere which is present here, right? So this is all mesial surface. So if you're trying to, I mean, th this doesn't come under point angle. Okay, okay, fine, fine. I got it. I got your question. You're talking about the facial wall, gingival seat, and the mesial wall, yes. This would be the point angle. And by the way, we do not have the classification of internal or external point angles, right? I got your question, by the way. So this is facial wall and gingival seat and the proximal wall, but not the pulpal one. Pulpal one again will be somewhere here, right? Yeah. Okay. So you're talking about these point angles? Yeah. How to name point angle and line angle based on the surface involved? For example, observe this, this is axial wall, right? And here we have a pulpal floor. So axial pulpal line angle. Uh, so let's talk about this corner. So we have facial wall, axial wall, and gingival seat, right? So come in these three terms: facial, axial, gingival point angle. So based on the surface involved, we name that accordingly. No, 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 Sai, the varnish doesn't stay. Varnish doesn't stay. We apply varnish, it gets dissolved immediately. It's only a thin residue, right? No, varnish doesn't stay. That's why we mentioned that the thickness, if you're if at all you're planning for anamnoplasty, make sure that it's not involved more than one third. Because even if you saucerize, there won't be any cavitation. There won't be any caries. When you see caries, first of all, there has to be Food lodgement over there, right? There has to be some source. So when you're trying to saucerizing it or making it self-cleansable or concave, there is no question of a caries form. In fact, if you leave it like this, if you leave, if the fissure is like this V-shape, if you leave it like that, there can be formation of caries, right? Yeah, fine. Okay. That is not in diagram. Okay, Abhishek, do one thing. You just draw on a piece of paper and share it in WhatsApp. We'll have a discussion over there, right? Because I'm unable to visualize uh, that particular point angle. The point angle which you said, mesiofacial and purple point angle. Purple wall will be on distal side. Oh, where is no distal extension? Mesio facial. Yeah, got it, got it. So you're talking about a normal class one cavity, right? So in class one cavity, we can we, we do have a point angle. Yes, I do agree. So mesio uh, facial pulpal. Yes, yes, that's true. So because since I was explaining this and since I saw that question, I was assuming that you're asking in specific related to this diagonal object. I'm sorry, I got you by the way. So for point angles, we do not have the criteria of internal or external because always the point angle the apex is towards the tooth, right? Fine. Yeah, got it. Right. So now let's uh, proceed with various steps in cavity prep. Right? By the way, I'm not going for theory, right? So we're just mainly focusing on key points. So we'll just uh, rush up covering as many important topics or important points as possible. So, uh, so as a formality, let me just summarize all the steps into preparation. So as you know, yeah, Munshi, we have a fissure classification, we have the fissure criteria, Y-shape, V-shape and all. 
Okay. Uh, anyways, I'll just uh, refer that and I'll give information pertaining to that at the end of the session, right? Yeah. So steps in tooth preparation, as you know, we have initial tooth preparation and final tooth preparation step. We have totally nine steps. Initial we have four and final we have five, including this number, try to remember, okay? So initial we have outline form and initial depth, primary resist resistance form, retention form and convenience form. And in final steps or final stage of tooth preparation we have remaining uh, removal of remaining infected dentine caries, pulp protection, secondary resistance and retention form, finishing of external walls and finally we have toileting of cavity, right? So toileting of cavity is nothing but inspecting, cleaning, if necessary, placement of desensitizer which we have discussed previously. By the way, desensitizer, we, in case of amalgam, we use 5% neutraldehyde and 35% hydroxyethyl methacrylate. So coming to the first step, outline form and initial depth. Hi Ajaj. Hello. So outline form and initial depth. So, the rationale or the objective for establishing an outline form and remember outline form has to be visualized even before starting the cavity preparation right and outline form when you're going for outline form care has to be taken not to involve the resistant areas or those areas of tooth structure which provide resistance like cusps marginal ridges triangular ridges etc right so we should include only pits and fissures including grooves so and I'm not going through the definition and all. So outline form and initial depth. So we go for, as we have discussed previously, the initial occlusal depth has to be 0.2 to 0.5 mm into dentin from the EEG. So that's for standardization. And axial depth, it has to be 0.5 mm into dentin, right? And the principles and all, that's all fine. Okay, we'll also we'll discuss the features because features are very important. So, one of the important features is preserving cuspal strength. So, we'll try to preserve as much cusp, as much oblique ridge or as much marginal ridge as possible. And, yeah, we have to preserve marginal ridge strength, minimize the facial ingual extension. So, by the way, when I say marginal ridge uh, has to be preserved, let me know how much amount of marginal ridge thickness has to be maintained. If at all there is a question, how much thickness of marginal ridge has to be maintained while going for a conventional amalgam preparation. So is it 1.6 mm as Mega is saying or is it 2 mm as Gina is saying? Bernice, one third the intercuspal distance is the width of cavity. I hope you're talking about the width. So, Abhishek, you say 0.5 mm minimum. Munshi, you say 1 mm. Okay, but we have a standardized value. That's the reason why I'm, uh, I'm asking you this particular question. Okay, fine. Yeah, the width of cavity, is it one third or one fourth? Okay, answer these two questions now. What should be the thickness of marginal ridge and what should be the width of a cavity for a molecule? Yeah. Yes, Prithi, you say 1.5 mm. Okay. It's difficult for me to guess whether you're answering for the thickness of marginal ridge or the width of cavity. Uh, Mega, when it is 1.6 for premolars, it, it has to be obviously be greater for molars, right? Yeah, so let me just answer. Good. So, marginal ridge thickness has to be double the width of a 245 bar. So 245 bar, if you observe here, we have a 245 bar here, the length of the bar is 3 mm, as you know. The length of this 245 bar is 3 mm and the width of this bar is 0.8 mm. So 3 mm length and 0.8 mm would be the width of the bar. This is very important because these dimensions help us in standardizing 
the cavity dimensions as well. So the width of marginal ridge in case of premolars has to be double the width of 245 bar which is equal to 1.6 mm as most of you pointed out. In case of molars it has to be a minimum of 2 mm the marginal ridge width right I hope it's clear. Now coming to the width of cavity, cavity width has to be one fourth intercuspal distance. So just uh, measure the intercuspal distance. Uh, in case of molars, usually it is 6 mm, right? So intercuspal distance in case of molars around 6 mm. So one fourth of intercuspal distance mounts to around 1.5 mm. So the width of cavity would be around 1.5 mm. The marginal ridge thickness as we discussed 1.6 and 2 mm respectively and the depth of cavity from the cusp tip or from the pit it is approximately 1.5 to 2 mm or from DEG it is 0.2 to 0 0.5 mm just make a note of all these values observe the diagram simultaneously it will be easy for you to memorize right and also in one of the features of outline form as I said we have to preserve cuspal strength we have to preserve adequate marginal ridge right and also we have to connect two close defects so two close defects which are less than 0.5 mm for example you have two defects here this is one carious lesion this is another carious lesion if the distance between them is less than 0.5 mm then we connect these areas and go for cavity preparation accordingly right so that's very important so close defects which are less than 0.5 mm especially in case of maxillary molar uh, you, you do involve oblique ridge when the defects in mesial and distal cavity are closer and the distance is less than 0.5 mm right so these are some of the important points pertaining to outline form and initial depth and then we'll proceed with primary resistance form and retention form we just have a one minute break i'll just have some water and i'll be back right so in the meantime you have any patients you can just drop them and by the way one fourth of intercuspal distance the width is for amalgam cavity for inlay it is one third for direct filling goal or direct goal it is around one fifth of intercuspal distance yeah we're talking about direct filling goal okay so you just have a one minute break Okay. Yeah. Thanks for waiting. So we'll proceed with the next step. So primary resistance form. So primary resistance form. See, it's not just about adding or providing resistance to the restoration which you are placing. So as I said, if you remember the operative dentistry definition, we are talking about not only the restoration but also the tooth, not only the tooth but the entire oral cavity, but not just oral cavity but the entire patient. So that's the way of approach we need to have while performing any treatment. We are not just treating one cavity or one defect or one tooth. We are taking care of the entire patient, right? Have this perspective, you will have greater satisfaction at the end of the treatment, right? So primary resistance form resistance to various forces which are principally directed along the long axis of the tooth resistance to what these forces and by whom resistance by restoration as well as the tooth structure so while designing cavity preparation while incorporating these resistance form features we need to keep in mind that resistance has to be imparted not only to the restoration we're placing but also to the tooth which we are proceeding with so various features of resistance include relatively horizontal flows flat pulpal flow box like shape as you can see here inclusion of weakened tooth structure because 
amalgam doesn't reinforce to first of all if weakened tooth structure is not involved then there can be fracture of that particular tooth structure and refer noise principles again you'll have much more idea so weakened tooth structure has to be involved in the design of a cavity that is extension for prevention right and also preservation of cusps and marginal ridges is also a resistance feature rounding internal line angles the internal line angles are not rounded line angles and point angles there can be stress concentration which can lead to fracture a sharp axopalpal line angle would lead to fracture of dash a sharp axogingival line angle could lead to fracture of dash transferring these questions a sharp axopalpal line angle would lead to fracture of tooth structure or amalgam and a sharp axogingival line angle could lead to fracture of tooth structure or amalgam hi kalpana good evening so bernis you see amalgam restriction okay cool yeah so whenever an external line angle is sharp so obviously the forces are focused or concentrated towards the restriction right the sharper axopalpal line angle could lead to fracture of restriction whereas internal line angles they're sharp and pointed there could be stress concentration in the tooth it's not that the tooth gets fractured but there is greater probability for fracture to happen right and also adequate thickness of restorative material is another resistance feature so what should be the minimum thickness of amalgam in order for it to stay in a cavity and also reduction of cusps for capping when indicated so try answering this question we'll proceed with the discussion yeah so adequate thickness of amalgam in order for the restoration to stay is Yeah, as you rightly said, Bernie Stina would be. Yeah, it is one point five mm, right? The these values are very important, right? And now we are talking about cusp capping. Even cusp capping is a resistance feature because obviously when the tooth is wider, the cavity is wider, you have to go for cusp capping, which adds up to resistance. So we have certain criteria here, and if you can observe this diagram, I hope it's clear. Ah, uh, it's not so clear, but anyway, I'll just try to focus that here. see this is a central groove right so this forms a central groove and this is the cusp tip okay so if the distance from the central groove to the cusp tip so for example if this is a cavity outline something like this okay since we have half of the tooth structure involved if the distance between the central groove and the cusp tip if it is half i mean if the defect is extending till half then we need not go for cusp capping if the defect or the carious lesion is extending between 1/2 to 2/3 the distance between the central groove and the cusp tip we have to consider cusp capping and most importantly if the defect or carious lesion extends more than 2/3 that is if the defect extends till here based on the distance between the central groove and the cusp tip then we have to go for cusp capping which is mandatory so depending upon the distance between the central groove and the cusp tip we have this criteria of cusp capping cusp capping is not indicated when the distance between the defect is half the distance or less than half the distance between the central groove and cusp tip half to two thirds we'll consider cusp capping more than two thirds we have to go for cusp capping which is mandatory right i hope it's clear yeah that's true more than 2/3 the distance between the central groove and cusp tip exactly just you know so these features so we can have multiple choice question asking you which of the following are all of the following the given options are resistance form features except so that's the reason i'm trying to focus on the features so relatively horizontal floors box like shape including or inclusion of weakened tooth structure preservation of cusps and marginal ridges 
cusp capping if necessary and also adequate thickness of restrained material and rounding of line angles and point angles. As such, you need not really remember the list because if you try to memorize the list, there is a chance that you might forget one or two points, right? So that's obvious. So understand the concept and then read it. So obviously you can make out if at all equation is given from this particular topic. Now coming to retention form. So I'm sure you are very much familiar with retention form. So retention form, the objective is to prevent dislodgement of restoration. We're talking about restoration, dislodgement of restoration. So preventing the dislodgement against tipping or lifting forces. So lifting forces which act along the long, long axis away from the tooth, whereas tipping forces are those which are considered as tipping or tilting forces, right? So resistance or to those kind of forces and making sure that the material doesn't get displaced in response to these forces. So retention features, obviously the primary retention features as you can see we have occlusal convergence and also the occlusal doubtate. So if you remember, doubtate, let me just draw that here. Something like this. Doubtail form. Okay? So you should have adequate thickness of uh, marginal ridge here. That is very important. So doubtail is something which appears in this fashion. The tail of a doubt, a bird doubt. If you uh, if you have if you use this soap doubt, you can see the bird over there. Okay, you can just Google out, you'll get the image. Right, so it resembles the tail of doubt. Doubt tail is also a retentive feature. So occlusal convergence is the primary retentive feature. That's very important. So that is in case of amalgam restoration. So what about a cast restoration like inlay, onlay, or any crown? What would be the mode of retention? Because for amalgam, you are placing occlusal convergence. But for inlay, for example, you place divergent walls, right? The walls will be divergent occlusal. So in case of that kind of scenario, how do you get retention? So try answering this question. So what is the mode of retention or how do we achieve retention when we are going for a divergent kind of orientation of walls for inlay or any cast restoration? Amul will answer, we'll try answering those questions at the end of this session, right? But we don't go for placement of grooves, skirts or uh, uh, secondary retentive features in case of inlays. No, cast restorations we usually don't go for them. Cementation, okay, Munshi, uh, well tried, but cementation is also not the appropriate answer because I, the reason why I smiled is because even I answered the same question during my final exam my work and that's not appropriate answer. We all assume that it's looting cement which helps in retention. Bevels, no. Any better answer? Okay, well tried. So bevels are placed in order to have a better marginal fit and also to increase surface area in composite. So bevels have altogether different functions, right? So in case of cast restorations, in fact, we have a, a divergence of walls, two to five degrees per wall. So the main mode of retention in case of these inlays or onlays or cast restorations is So it is through frictional retention. So we have near parallel walls. Two to five degrees per wall is near parallel. So near parallel walls, we have this frictional retention, which is the more main mode of retention in case of cast restoration, right? So that's very important. 
Secondary, it's luting cement. Luting cement, the main function is to seal the interface between the tooth preparation and the restoration which you are placing, right? So luting cement altogether has a different role. So it, it has secondary role in retention, but the primary role is yeah, frictional retention or near parallelism. Okay, right. And what about composite? For amalgam, I said convergent faults. For cast restorations, I said uh, I discussed and I said frictional retention. Then what about composite? So composite, I'm sure you're all familiar with. We have micro mechanical retention, right? Acid etching and all. Okay, that's fine. So these are uh, the primary retentive forms for various types of restoration. We're trying to generalize it because we're talking about the fundamentals of tooth preparation, not just amalgam. Okay? When you have this comparative analysis, it will be easy for you to analyze and to understand and also to remove it. Yeah. Close parallelism, I'm just quoting what's given in textbook. Close parallelism of prepared vertical walls is principal retention form for cast metal restorations. Another being use of luting agent that bonds tooth structure. So the primary or the principal form of retention is near parallelism which is achieved by frictional retention. Okay? Yeah. Now we have the fourth step that is convenience form. So convenience form is nothing but having accessibility, a proper observation and ease of operation of a particular tooth or of a particular cavity, right? The occlusal divergence of vertical walls of tooth preparation for class 2. So just now I discussed about the occlusal divergence of walls in case of cast restoration, right? So they are examples for convenience form. They can be also be quoted as examples for convenience form. Just make a note of this point. The occlusal divergence of vertical walls of tooth preparation for class 2 cast restorations also may be considered as convenience form. Okay. Right. Yeah, uh, it's micro mechanical bond rather than calling it mechanical. Yeah, that's sufficient. And then final tooth preparation, we have removal of infected and affected dentin. I'm sure you're familiar with these terms. And also we have one video on the differences between infected and affected dentin, the concept given by Fizayama. And also I have discussed various graphs in the video. I posted that long back. You can refer the various playlists, right? Conservative playlists, you will get that video in the playlist, right? So, uh, removal of any infected dentin or old restrictive material or any remaining enamel, pit and fissure, that's all fine, okay. Then we have pulp production, step 6. And pulp production, please refer the video, remaining uh, dentin thickness, RDT and also various agents for pulp production, we discussed there in detail regarding the pulp protection and also as I said I haven't mentioned about resin modified glass enamel there so I have discussed about resin modified glass enamel in this present video in the introductory part. I will just briefly summarize about RMGLC especially RMGLC as a liner. So it's not given in textbook in fact I got that from one of the review articles in PubMed so you can rely this information and you can make a note of this information pertaining to resin modified GLC. So resin modified GIC when used as a liner is placed in thickness of 0.5 to 0.75 mm and since it is resin modified it has this property of resisting to various forces, compaction forces etc. Right? Because if you go for calcium hydroxide it's very weak mechanically and so resin modified GIC insulates pulp from thermal changes, bonds to dentin, micromechanical and also since it's GIC there will be chemical bond as well. And it releases fluoride because it is GIC and resists forces of condensation and decreases microlicus because of the chemical bond. So these are some of the advantages of using a resin modified GIC as a cavity liner. And remember, it's given the differences between amalgam and composite that liner indications resin modified GIC is indicated in case of deep restorations. Also, we can use this in case of composite restorations, underlying composite, in case of deep cavities, we can go for resin modified glass and number cement. 
And then secondary resistance and retentive features, we have various secondary resistance and retentive features like just make a note of these points, we will simultaneously try to represent them here. So we have various secondary retentive features like retentive and resistant features, retention grooves and cores. So vertically oriented retention grooves are used to provide additional retention for proximal portions of some conventional tooth preparation. So in this case, you can go for placement of a retentive groove along this fascio-axial line angle. So along this line angle, you can go for placement of a retentive groove, right? So vertically oriented retentive groove. So vertically oriented retentive grooves are used to provide additional retention for proximal portions. And horizontally oriented retentive grooves are placed in class 3 and class 5. If you remember, so class 5, let me just write down here. I think it will be visible if I write here. Yeah, fine. So class 5 cavity, if you remember, we go for placement of retentive grooves. along these line angles, right? So, incisor, axial, gingival axial line angle. So, we go for placement of grooves, or horizontally directed grooves in these areas, right? So, in case of class 3 and also class 5, we go for horizontally oriented grooves, vertically oriented grooves in case of proximal preparations. And retention core, is placed in incisal retention of class 3 amalgam. So assume this as class 3. So for incisal retention, we go for placement of a curve. Yeah. And then we have skirts. Skirts are nothing but the extensions of cast restorations along the line angles, along the external line angles for added retention as well as resistance. Just make a note of this point. Skirts improve retention as well as resistance that would be sufficient right and bevel enamel margins so beveling we have a specific function we'll discuss the uses of beveling subsequently right and pins slots steps and amalgam pins so pin retain amalgam are quite familiar they improve retention as well as resistance as given in the textbook right so pins and slots increase retention and resistance forms so make a note of these points, that will be sufficient. And then we have the 8 step procedures for finishing the external walls of tooth preparation. So external walls, here we have bevels. So for example, if you have to talk about the gingival cavus surface margin in case of class 2, usually we go for a gingival bevel. Bevels are not indicated for amalgam restorations, but we are going for bevel placement in case of a proximal cavity extension of an amalgam class 2. The reason is, if you observe here, if you observe here, I mean, can you notice, we have some enamel rods here. So these enamel rods, they do not have, so this is all dentin, right? So you agree with me, this is all dentin and this is all enamel, right? So these enamel rods in this area do not have the support of dentin. So these are unsupported enamel rods. So these unsupported enamel rods have to re remove or else what happens if you place restoration in this context, these enamel rods will get fractured, there can be micro leakage again and associated problems with micro leakage like secondary caries, there can be staining, there can be sensitivity etc. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to eliminate these unsupported enamel rods. Okay? So we will place a bevel, we will place a 15 to 20 degree bevel using a gingival marginal trimmer. So GMT is used for placing gingival bevel or to remove unsupported enamel. You are placing a bevel of 15 to 20 degrees, but remember, this is very important, the KO surface angle is 90 degrees. So when you place a bevel of 15 to 20 degrees, obviously the KO surface margin, as you can see, will be more or less 90. Okay, this is very important. So in order to achieve this KO surface orientation of 90 for amalgam, we are going for placement of a bevel to remove unsupported enamel rods. That's very important. So this comes under finishing of external walls. And also beveling. 
So this is one part of beveling. And why do we go for beveling in general for composite or for cast restoration? And here we have important functions. Beveling produces a stronger enamel margin as you have seen here. We have removed unsupported enamel, right? So we have stronger enamel margin. And beveling also permits marginal seal in slightly undersized castings. If the casting is undersized, then it pro helps in providing the marginal seal. It provides a marginal metal that can be easily be burnished and adapted. So if you remove a sliding lap joint, so in cast restorations, what we do is we place the 30 to 40 degree bevel further. Uh, bevel will be increased. So when you place that bevel and when you try to fit a cast restoration, there will be sliding and there will be simultaneously fitting. We call that as sliding lap joint. So uh, anyways, don't worry. So we place a 30 to 40 degree bevel in case of cast restorations to improve marginal burnishability because the metal, for example, assume that I have given a 30 to 40 degree bevel here and I have placed a cast restoration which is blue in color. So this margin, metal margin, can be burnished onto the tooth surface, right? So we have these additional benefits by placing bevels, right? So bevels are placed to produce stronger enamel margins, to improve the marginal seal, and to improve the fit of a processes, especially the cast restoration. And bevels are not indicated for amalgam and for ceramic restorations, except at the gingival margin for amalgam. In composites, we go for beveling because in case of composites, beveling increases the surface area, right? And also it improves aesthetics. Because once you have a bevel, you know what happens? Say, so assume that we have an anterior tooth here. So there is a fracture here. So there is a fracture here. So if you place composite directly over this area, so the junction will be clearly be visible. So by beveling, for example, we are trying to increase the surface area and the composite gradually merges with that of tooth structure on the beveled area. So there is enhancement in aesthetics and also there is, as I said, increase in surface area. So these are some of the advantages of beveling in relation to composite restorations. In relation to amalgam, in relation to past metal restorations, and in relation to components, right? So that's very important. And then you have final toileting of cavity, uh, cleaning with water, removing all visible debris. And then here we have disinfection. So we have one important point here. So disinfection of cavity can be done using chlorhexidine. So chlorhexidine. can be used for disinfecting the cavity because it is antimicrobial in nature, right? And most importantly, the added advantage of using chlorhexidine, especially for composite restoration. So before placing composite, before going for bonding agent placement, if you disinfect the cavity with chlorhexidine, chlorhexidine is inherently an MMP inhibitor. So what is MMP? MMP is nothing but matrix metalloproteinase. So these matrix metalloproteinases are naturally found in dentin. So these MMPs, they degrade collagen that is present in dentin. So when you go for acid etching, the dentin mesh is exposed, right? So that collagen is destroyed because of these inherent MMPs. So once the collagen mesh is involved or destroyed, what happens? There won't be proper intermingling of the resin and the collagen mesh and there won't be better hybrid layer formation or bonding. The bonding can be affected. So as a result, when you go for disinfecting with chlorhexidine, what happens is this chlorhexidine, because of its property of not only antibacterial property, but also it has a property of inhibiting matrix metalloproteinases. So it destroys the MMPs there and improves the bond strength. So that's very important. You can just make a note of this point. Because it's a, based on the latest research, you can expect a question from this area. I'm just quoting what's given in textbook. In our studies have shown that chlorhexidine solution application to etched dentin is able to limit the activity of local collagenolytic enzyme inhibitors matrix metalloproteinases which are able to degrade 
exposed to collagen. So we have inherently MMPs over there which destroy collagen. So by using this uh, chlorhexidine, this chlorhexidine inhibits MMP. As a result, helps in stabilizing the hybrid layer while uh, going for uh, restorations with composite. Only the short term benefit has been demonstrated, long term benefit still it is under investigation. So that's pertaining to disinfecting the cavity with chlorhexidine in specific after uh, acid etching before placement of composite. And also, as I said, we have desensitizers. Desensitizers, they plug in the retinal tubules, right? And we use this 5% uh, glutaraldehyde uh, in 35% EMA or uh, desensitizer, which is used in case of uh, when you're planning for amalgam, in amalgam cavity preparations. But for composite, we need not use a separate desensitizer because the bonding agent itself helps in bonding and also helps in occluding the dentinal tubules. And remember, the objective of desensitizer is to block the dentinal tubules, thereby prevent fluid movement based on hydrodynamic theory and decrease post-op sensitivity, right? And then we have amalgam box only preparations. Okay, uh, and then we have tunnel preparations. As one of you rightly asked, tunnel preparation is nothing but, for example, uh, you have a proximal um, cavity. Let me just draw that here. Uh, we are short of space, actually. Uh, if I can draw it here. Okay. So, assume that this is a mesial side, this is the occlusal side. So, we have caries something like this. So this is the lesion. I hope you can see that. Yeah. So we have all the shaded area which is carious lesion. So we have proximal caries and pit and fissure caries. But the marginal ridge here is intact. Okay. So in these cases what we do is we try to preserve this marginal ridge and we try to prepare a cavity. So this is called as tunnel preparation from the occlusal towards the proximal. So that is tunnel preparation. And this is not a sound scientific method and hence it is not advocated, right? So this technique is controversial and is not supported by this book. So this preparation joins an occlusion lesion with a proximal lesion by means of a prepared tunnel under the uninvolved marginal ridge. And we have these additional amalgam restorations where we go for placement of uh, meter, 4 meter. 4 meters of bonding agent which is used for going uh, placing an adhesive amalgam. Even that's not a success, that's not successful, and hence it's been discarded. We're not using bonded amalgams because long term bond stability is not reliable. Okay, so somehow uh, I could manage to rush up to the entire topic fundamentals of tooth preparation in brief manner. In fact, we take three or four theory classes. Uh, at undergraduate level in order to complete this topic but since we are having this PG orientation we could at least try to summarize various important points right so if you have any queries you can drop them if I know I'll answer them right away or I will refer I'll get back with references and I'll post in the description of the video once it gets uploaded to YouTube right and by the way, one of you asked regarding uh, drug of choice for cyanide yesterday. So I posted that in the description. You can just go through the description of the previous video. A flare, a tapered fissure bar can be used. Or even hand instruments can be used. By the way, for finishing external walls, we can use a uh, fluted bird, a straight, I mean a straight fissure bird and also we, we can use hand instruments to in order to smoothen the walls of cavity. We use 245 bird cavity preparation bird to place flares or we can even use a straight fissure bird. How will you find the proper convenience form? Whether your instrument depends upon whether you are able to place the instrument in the cavity. If you are not able to place the instrument, if you are not able to observe the details of cavity, it means there is no adequate convenience form.
creep is nothing but amyl extant dependent plastic deformation. You can refer to Phillips, you have elaborate information on creep. Box shaped cavity, we go for placement of base in case of a uh, class 2, we place base on the pulpal floor and also on the axial wall, but we will not place base on gingival seat. Okay. And one of you asked regarding reverse S curve, right? Reverse S curve is given in case of maxillary first molar to preserve the mesofacial cusp. So it appears as a reverse S uh, to preserve the mesofacial cusp and also to have simultaneously a 90 degree cavo surface margin and to enhance aesthetics. So obviously when you are preserving mesofacial cusp, when you smile in few people, we can see even the molar side, the mesial aspect of the first molar, molar to molar smile. So it's a resistance feature and also it's an aesthetic way of preserving the cusp which enhances the aesthetics. Okay, so it's been a very lengthy session. Uh, I, I can understand it's really challenging to follow uh, such lengthy sessions, right? Cusp capping, we have already discussed that silicia. So anyways, I'll briefly summarize. Cusp capping is nothing but based on the distance from the cusp tip and the central groove. We advise cusp capping. If we, we have a defect, which is not extending more than half the distance between the central groove and the cusp tip, cusp tapping is not indicated. If it is between half to two thirds, cusp tapping we, we consider, uh, we can or we cannot, uh, it depends. And if it is more than two thirds, if the defect extends more than two thirds the distance between the central primary groove and cusp tip, we have to go for mandatory cusp tapping. So this is the uh, illustration which I have presented here in order to explain cusp capping. By the way, cusp capping is a resistance feature. I'm just checking whether I have missed any convenience. Okay. Fine. Okay. Pressure. I think, I think it's three to five LPs. You can find all this information, Amul. You refer a uh, Phillips. Refer Phillips. I and mean, which year are you in, Amul? Yes, cusp capping is capping of cusp. Capping in the sense we're trying to cover the cusp with a restorative material. We'll reduce the cusp by 1.5 mm minimum and then we'll try to cap it, cover it with a restorative material amalgam. Cusp capping usually is done for cast restorations, also partial on this and all. Amalgam again will have complex amalgam, that's again difficult, but cast restorations we, we can go for cusp capping. Etching, the objective of etching is to not, I mean obviously, it's not to use the property of antimicrobial nature. No. As far as I remember, I don't I, even I haven't heard of that. You are saying I haven't heard of that. Usually, I mean, most of the practitioners were not familiar with the use of chlorhexylene, so we do not use. But research studies, and moreover, the chlorhexylene usage, uh, we have only short-term benefit as per the literature. So long-term benefit, there need to be um, further evaluation. We need to have further evaluation based on in vitro studies and in vivo studies, right? Okay. Right. So I hope, I really hope you could follow what we have discussed so far. So you would have got at least 15 to 20 key points in the entire lecture today. So if you find it useful, we'll continue at the same pace. Or you have any suggestions, you can drop them. Uh, we'll try to improve further, right? And also we plan to have more and more virtual classroom sessions soon. Right? So based on the time, based on convenience, we'll try to incorporate more virtual classroom sessions uh, very soon.
Okay, I'll stay for another two minutes. If you have any queries, anything, you can drop them here or you can uh, mail me, right? I see a lot of attrition in today's live session. Because at the beginning I have seen many students, but now most of them I think they left. Because it's 10.40. Tunnel preparation is different. Uh, tunnel preparation, it's like we proceed from here. We proceed from the occlusal cavity and to the proximal side, right? It has nothing to do with cusp capping. Cusp capping altogether depends upon the width of the occlusal cavity, the facial ingle width. Shall we conclude the session now? Yeah, fine. So we'll see you again tomorrow with another textbook discussion at 9 o'clock, right? So tomorrow we're going to have physiology, homeostasis, or milieu interior. Right? Tomorrow we'll see you again at 9 o'clock sharp with textbook discussion. Hope this session was of some use for you and that all the best. Take care. Bye. Yeah, good night. Good night everyone.